Hi, everyone, and welcome to Chai Side Chats, an exclusive interdisciplinary talk show featuring interviews with folks about creativity, the arts, healing, personal growth, spirituality, culture, representation, mental and emotional well being, among a host of other things. I am your host, Aishwarya Subramanian. And today's episode of Chai Side Chats features a couple of interdisciplinary musicians who combine elements of various genres of music, including Carnatic, South Indian classical, and jazz. They are both PhD students of music at Harvard, and they have performed and toured extensively around the world at a variety of venues. In addition to being exemplary performing artists and composers, this percussionist vocalist duo are also scholars who critically examine nuances and politics of music through the lens of their identities as South Asian, South Indian queer women in the diaspora. Please welcome Rajana Swaminathan and Ganavya Daviswami. Hello friends, welcome to Chai Side Chats. Thank you guys for being here. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, so I wanted to start just by talking about creativity since that's you know one of the many topics that we are hoping to touch on in this talk show series. So before we you know jump into the questions, um, I wanted to start by sharing a video clip, which might be a little bit of a trip down memory lane. So we'll start with that and then dive into some of the questions. But then we started talking about creativity. I mean, mind you, this is me, the girl who ran away from a career in arts because I wasn't sure what exactly creativity was or how you can monetize it. And they asked me, is creativity for the privileged? Or they felt that creativity was for the privileged. Then they asked me what was creativity, and I had no idea. <laughs> I don't know how many of the audience members can answer that question. So, um, the reason I wanted to start there is just because, you know, my question to you is what is your definition of creativity? And when I was doing my deep dive of research, I came across this clip that I wanted to share. So, <laughs> um, yeah, either of you can start. Um, just, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on w how you would define creativity for yourselves now in this moment. I keep forgetting that that clip exists. Um, <laughs> you know, to, I, because that clip was brought up, I think just ethically, I feel a responsibility to to talk about the clip just a little bit. The context is um, the context was when I was a postgraduate fellow at Berkeley in Spain, and it was their first TED um, event, and uh, some of the professors there knew that right after my psychology degree, um, which is kind of what I'm humorously referencing there by saying that I ran away briefly from the arts. Um, when I, right after my psychology degree, I worked for a brief time as a counselor in a program in the Everglades Correctional Institution. And uh, there's a lot to be said there about that experience. Um, I was 19 or so when I graduated my undergraduate degree. So the fact that even someone in that position could, of that age could be in that position itself, I think says a lot about, about many things and many structures. Now that being said, um, I would call maybe creativity a state of mind where I feel the spirit, I feel my body, I feel the spirit not only in my body, but the essence that connects us all. Um, to me, it's prayer. It is a form of prayer. It is a form of remembrance. It's uh, a state where I feel my mother and the mothers and the father and my fathers who have contributed to my my life. Um, it feels like a state where I am able to be in conversation with the elders in my past and simultaneously a state where it feels like I am hopefully making the world just a little bit better for the future to come. And what comes in that state can be many things. It can be speech, it can be sound, it can be um, words in that state, in the in the best versions of that state, I'm also able to listen to the signals of the world better. I think it's it's kind of about finding that balance between 
channeling what came before and also recognizing what is so unique uh, about the present moment. Um, and I see this coming from, in some ways coming from a tradition, uh, that being a, a complicated word in and of itself, but this idea of what is, what is it that we carry uh, in the process of upholding a tradition? Mm. Um, and what does it mean to improvise? And what does it mean to compose and, and actually have a voice in the context of a tradition? And this can be in the context of an identity, it can be in the context of uh, just history, but, but the idea is what is it that is very particular to this moment? And are you in that moment uh, paying attention to all that is beautiful about that one mm. uh, moment? And are you accepting it rather than holding yourself to some standard from the past or some kind of intention to imitate mm. something that has ha come before you? Mm. Um, and not to say that those are, are lesser forms of creativity. Those are definitely like, for me, uh, stepping stones to learning how to inhabit a particular form or practice. Mm. Um, but ultimately, I think at least the way that I write music and, and sort of work with my ensemble is I, I give them melodies that I've come up with and that mean something to me. And I almost never ask them to play them exactly as is. Or if they do, I, I will say, don't play it literally. I'll, I'll say, you know, just you decide what you need to do in that moment uh, because I can't tell you what's right for that moment. Mm -hmm. It might be playing the melody. It might be playing something into the melody. It might be completely playing something that's not written on the page at all. Uh, but I just see myself as somebody as a, maybe a conduit or you know somebody who provides a vessel for you to pour yourself into. Um, mm. But for me, creativity is about being fully aware and, and also surrendering in some sense to the particularities of the moment. Mm. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's, it's interesting because, you know, as both of you were talking about just, it sounds like there's some similarities, right? In terms of being aware, being present, being in the now. Um, so to speak. And, um, you know, Rajana, since you were talking about how when you work with your band, you kind of give them a little bit of an idea of what a score could be and then like really encourage them to actually not stick to that. And like, just like tr transparency on my part, I'm like noticing I don't want to stick to my script of questions that I have for you because there's like so many rich things that are coming up in our conversation already. So um you know, in, in terms of creativity, like one thing that came up for me as both of you were sharing is this idea of flow, right? I don't know if you're familiar with that, yeah. Um, so flow is basically like kind of like, I don't know, a suspended state of existence or experience. And um, yeah, I'm curious, like what does your experience of flow feel like when you are creating, whether individually in your own personal practice as an artist or when you're collaborating with, you know, other artists as well? Yeah, I mean, suspending is a, a good word because I, I think what you're really suspending is judgment. Um, it's uh, because I, I can tell you I've been in moments where things don't flow and I realize what's actually happening is that I haven't suspended the judgment. And it's it's not always easy to control that. Um, it, it sometimes happens, you know, it sometimes depends on what happened that day or just kind of mm -hmm. like the, the time period that you're in. Um, but I, that's just one thing I've noticed uh, when I am completely in flow, it's when I allow myself to make mistakes and when I don't judge those mistakes uh, beforehand. Because if, if you're in a state where you're constantly judging what you're writing or you're creating in the moment, you're blocking the flow. Um, and so it, it's actually, I, I think of it in, in almost like a spiritual way of, uh, you know, suspending your ego also for a moment uh, mm -hmm. and to not feel in that moment that you are the one creating. I mean, it is you and it's it's you in like the most divine, beautiful, uh, present way, but it's also not you. And I think thinking of it in that way allows it to flow uh, easier, at least for me. The relationship to ego and the relationship to flow seems to, particularly the relationship to ego, that when we are egoless, it allows for a kind of expansion. Um, I think that when a teacher doesn't teach that line 
properly, what it seems to, however intentionally or unintentionally advocate for is um, kind of a lack of self-presence that you have to disappear. But I think what that, for me, what that philosophy is advocating for is equality among all, which means yourself also has to be equally <laughs> equally present. Because I think some of the some of the the issues, not issues, but some of the yeah, I would say issues. Um, I've seen in the the practices that are more explicitly devotionally based is that as with any any kind of social being, there are tensions, but for instance, in Carnatic music, or if we go even further into the religious or spiritual practices, like when I would walk and sing uh, on our way to Pandarpur, like these very, what is framed as deeply religious practices, there's a lot of talk of ego, and uh, but we're also human beings. So there's always going to be social issues that we need to talk about, but you somehow, your throat is stopped by this philosophy of ego saying you must be, you must aspire towards egolessness. So how can I say, well, that thing that I witnessed was hurtful or harmful if I don't exist. So that's the only thing that I feel like that can also counteract this ability for us to flow and breathe and be the way that we're all meant to be. Not to take away from what you're saying, but like that's just a, that's a thought that That's came absolutely up. true, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wasn't thinking on that level, but that's uh, definitely true. Yeah, I guess what I was talking about is is just like where is the awareness uh, located in that moment of creating? Mm. Uh, and for me, this experience of like, you know, for me, it happens most often on the piano and I'll be just playing and time will just go by and I have no idea how, like it would have been two hours, and I would like, forget to eat or, you know, that experience for me um, is I guess what I meant by, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm trying to achieve a sort of egolessness, it, it just sort of happens and, and it happens in the process of sort of immersing myself into sound. Right. I understand. Um, so I've been spending uh, some time in the mountains in rural Oregon, uh, which is where I've been. A sister friend teacher handed me her bass, and um, I, I kind of was playing it nonstop for a few days, and I forgot to eat, and I think I was eating once every two days. So that's what I meant by, and it had repercussions, actually. Um, it has repercussions up until today, and I think that as artists, sometimes there's the tendency to romanticize those ecstatic states, um, but, or even like romanticize the difficult part of it when it's intentional that, you know, to flow, I need to consume X, Y, Z, um, which also, which is also a difficult, uh, it's not difficult. I just don't think that's the only truth out there. So right now I think my, that's what I'm also asking myself is how to, how to engage with those ecstatic states for as much as possible, but also in the most sustainable way possible because you know part of the reason why I came back home outside of the fact that I needed to eat two meals a day and remember what it felt like to do that um was also not to like not to to give the myth that I could only be in that kind of a state of flow when isolated when I didn't have to you know cook for my family or I didn't have to to answer queries of loved ones um but the only thing that I think that's coming up when I think about flow for me is um, something that was once told to me and that I have remembered since in English as follows, which is if you're nervous and you have stage fright, it's probably because you're focusing on how others are seeing you. But the quickest way to neutralize that and to enter the state of flow is to turn, like redirect that, to instead focus all your energy on seeing those in front of you. And I think, to me, that is the kind of, um, that is the practice that takes away the hand shakings or the, or the, any, anything that stands in the way. You know, since I think we were talking about how, you know, flow and sort of circumstances that allow us to experience that state, right? Um, I'd love to hear about how both of you, if you have any like rituals that sort of help you get there, right? You know, kind of, you talked about how connecting to other people and like seeing other people really helps you with that and can help 
get out of like the inner critic, I guess that might be coming up. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear if either of you have any like pre-performance or pre-practice or pre-rehearsal kind of rituals that sort of help you help to enable that state of flow that we've been talking about. I don't know, this isn't really like a ritual, but I did notice a huge shift in just how I perform and how I practice when I started closing my eyes. I, I think that was never, I mean, if anything, I feel like we were told not to do that because it was like, you know, somehow disengaging or, you know, uh, would make it boring for the audience or somehow, you know, it was discouraged. But at some point I did let myself start closing my eyes and um, that changed a lot for me. And I think if there are moments when I feel like a bit self-conscious when I'm performing uh, or practicing, what usually helps me is to just close my eyes um, or focus on my breath. Maybe this applies uh, to a lot of people, but I just usually ha like having some quiet before I perform or before I create that usually just helps me to to center myself and to not have like a lot of thoughts bubbling up to the surface right before so in, in a sense that's the kind of ritual that I, I make sure that I'm kind of contain the external uh, input a little bit before I think that's one of the things that um, cemented our friendship early on is that right before our first gig of sorts, um, I think it was in LA, mm -hmm. <laughs> very long time ago. Um, I remember that I felt like I was trying to keep up with the conversations of people around us right before a gig. And Rajna knew who they were. So she came in and kind of, I can't remember what you did, but you kind of like, it felt like in my memory, you just whispered and said, I think she needs a moment or something happened. And then I was just released from that social contract. And then I could just go to quietness and be like, oh, I really needed this. Like I, I really needed that. Uh, this, is a, this is something I've had with me ever since I was young. Um, it's a Vitalan and Rakumai. Um, and so I allow myself to build an altar. And I'm going to have a full day of a recording studio, small, large, depending on what kind of it is, but I allow myself to, to do that in the moment of prayer, because I also think it kind of announces to the space a, a requirement or a need that you have. I've noticed that once you do that, then everyone who's working with you also understands that you depend on that. So just carrying, carrying objects like this, familiar objects like this, and familiar smells has also been very useful, so that there's some kind of an association of, uh, of safety because the association of being in this space is very very safe for me to take bits and pieces of that and then kind of re-invoke the essence of that mm -hmm. in space this has been a very new practice but it's been very helpful for me yeah i want to transition a little bit and just ask you both about how it's been studying music in academia which is very different from kind of these like intentional spaces that i think you both sort of strive to create when you're performing or when you're rehearsing, when you're recording. Um, so yeah, what is it like to study music as South Indian musicians in Western academia, especially at Harvard? Now I'm, I'm at kind of at the end of my uh, time at Harvard. It's been six years and I'll be finishing my dissertation in the next few months. Um, and I think that question used to be there and like those lines were more boldly drawn about, uh, oh, Western academia and Indian music. And I think maybe somewhere along the middle, I think I was uh, really feeling the, the boldness of the box around academia. But now I wonder if it's just institutions in general and if it's just social formations in general that are worth thinking about. Um, because wherever there's power in pockets, um, in collectivities and uh, there are ways that we mold ourselves according to expectations uh, put on us by anybody. I think it's a challenge uh, to remember who you are. And I, I definitely 
been lost along the way. Um, I think I'm, it's actually, it's very connected to the, the thing we were talking about right before, which is this idea of bringing that which is familiar with you into spaces where that may not be the understanding or there may be other codes or there may be a different way of talking. Um, and that's, that's also something I've, I've learned. I mean, we we're both colleagues like pretty much have been going through this very new program together. Um, and I think I've learned a lot from the way that Ganavia has navigated uh, being in the institution. Um, and I think it's, it's been nice uh, to have uh, that sort of mirror along the way to, to feel like, you know, okay, I'm not the only one going through this and I might have my unique set of challenges and, uh, you know, but, but ultimately listening to how others are also navigating it and, and remembering that you're not the only person uh, fighting the institution, I think is uh, the less we think about institutions as these large, uh, powerful forces and the more we think about it as like, okay, there are individual people here who are making certain decisions or, or choosing to orient a particular way. Um, it just makes it a different kind of uh, scenario, at least in my head. Uh, I think in some ways for you as well. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. That's every single time we've, we've been in this room and there's been problem about the institution you start talking about the institution that has always been my response is the institution is just a bunch of people shireen hamza an amazing scholar uh, and artist told me who's also a student at phd at, at harvard told me that right when i was about to start your real learning is not going to actually happen in the classrooms it's going to happen in all the conversations with the other students outside and i think that's that is the truth for me in music also is that it's not just about what we learn in the classrooms but it's the life experience that teaches us that puts the soul in the words that we sing so trying to balance that out not being like i need to practice 10 hours a day which is beautiful which is what i'm doing right now but also just remember that everything every single thing that we do is is going is somehow feeding those moments that it works Wonderful. I also wanted to ask both of you about just, you know, work-life balance. You know, both of you are musicians who live together. You also collaborate quite frequently. You're in the same PhD program. And, um, you know, when there's such a close overlap of personal and professional spheres, I mean, I hate putting it in those boxes, but whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just curious to hear about how your, you know, relationship with each other, your multi-layered relationship, uh, you know, affects the work-life balance in your own well-being, self-care, work, work, workload, work ethic, things like that. You know, I, I've learned that from Rajna, but just allowing myself to say, you know, I actually am a very efficient worker and I am capable of, of like, even if there's 10 days to prepare, I am capable of doing it in a day. So I will allow myself to rest for nine days and not constantly be in anxiety, in a state of anxiety. Just accept that, you know what? It doesn't make sense. And one day I would love to be the person who works for one hour, 10 days, instead of 10 hours on the 10th day. But for now, that's it works and that's okay. And I'm not going to like stress everyone around me out. I, I guess the same way how you said, like you, you, you said, I hate putting it in the box of like the personal and the professional. In the same way, I think the box that actually separates work and life doesn't exist if if I if I'm doing it right, they're they're all folded into one. Because if they're not balanced, then the entire system actually collapses. And I'm going back to the question you had about rituals, I think I I'm, that balance is maintained in me also by guiding souls who remind me or our reflections, you said, and tell me, I think the balance is going off a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd say, <laughs> actually, I was surprised. You were saying you learned that from me because I was going to say I learned that from you. Uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do the same thing of like if I had a deadline in 10 days, I would take the entire 10 days and be stressed out about it the whole time. That's true. And, uh, and, stress, everybody. and stress everybody around me out. <laughs> um, I, yeah, you're right. I think it's it's about seeing the continuity between them and also seeing work as play rather than as whatever the capitalist framework of work and leisure that we are inheriting constantly. Um, especially as artists, I think that's really important. Um, I am actually grateful to my PhD advisor who recently told me to have fun with my dissertation because I think I was really stressing out until that point and he finally said, just have fun with it. And it like unlocked everything in my brain. It was like, oh, now I can actually work. I was quote unquote work. The, the moment I was told I'm allowed to play, I mean, we're artists, we're lucky that the word creative is even normally attached to what we do. But I just think about other people in other fields who may or may not have that framework. If we ourselves struggle to play, I can only imagine um, folks in fields that are, are not given the framework at all, or it's not even remotely in the discourse and I don't know if that exists, so I have to be honest. I, I've, I've thought that also that you know there might be disciplines that, but I don't think that's true because I think, as our friend Prashant would say, that even cooking, everything is creative. There's yeah. not a, there's nothing that is not creative. Even speaking, every single thing, every single one of us, are creators. Mm -hmm. The essence of life, you know, we improvise our way through life. I, and I love that. I think that's it's a really great way of conceptualizing it. So, um, yeah. So I want to transition now into our experiential exercise for today. Um, so many artists are at this point because of the pandemic disconnected from the experience of performing and presenting work physically. One of the things I'd like for us to do today is to revisit in our mind's eye and imagination, the experience of a performance and maybe the mm -hmm. moments that lead up to it. So I'm gonna lead us through a guided meditation for a few minutes um, and then we will have some time and space to sort of process and respond to that experience through some art making. So yeah, that's sort of the gist of what we're gonna do. How does that sound? Amazing, that's great. Great, okay. Awesome. And, you know, like I've, you know, done for previous experiential activities, I want to encourage all of my viewers to participate and follow along um, in this exercise with us. I think whether or not you're a performer, you can, um, I invite you to engage in this as maybe an audience member or someone who's just going to experience a live performance if you're not necessarily a performer or an artist in that way. So... Great, we'll begin. Um, so go ahead and get into a comfortable position. And if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, you can close your eyes or just bring it down to a soft gaze in front of you. And just take a moment to notice your breathing. The breath is always a wonderful way to ground into our bodies. Just notice the way your body is breathing today. And take a few deep breaths to really reconnect to yourself and start to become a little more centered. Once you begin to feel a little more grounded in your breathing, in your bodies, imagine yourself in a performance space of your choice. Maybe it's even a familiar or favorite place 
where you like to perform or where you like to watch performances. Imagine yourself there and pay attention to how it feels to be there, to be in this physical space. Notice what the energies of the room are like. What's the temperature of the space that you are in? Is it warm? Is it cold? Who else is there with you in this space? Are there a lot of people running around? doing various things? Or is it more quiet, composed, and relaxed? Or perhaps somewhere in between? Perhaps we fast forward a little bit and we're now at the moments just before the performance is about to begin. What's coming up for you? What thoughts, what feelings, what sensations do you notice in your body? your mind, your spirit. As we move towards the performance starting, you're on stage, or you're watching a performance as it begins, singing, playing, listening, connecting. Perhaps it's your favorite piece or song that's being performed. Notice what comes up for you as you engage with that. Notice what it's like to be physically present with audience members during this performance experience. Let yourself take snapshots of some of these moments from this visualization as moments you can return to at any time. And slowly, gradually bring your attention and awareness back into your physical body, and back to your breathing. Feel the flesh of your body against the chair or the floor. 
gently turning your attention back to the sounds around you. In this moment. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back into the space. So before we debrief and, you know, talk about the guided meditation, I think there's, you know, a lot to be said in nonverbal experiences like we were talking about earlier. So I want to, you know, give us a few moments to just use an art modality of your choice to respond to your experience of the meditation. So you can draw, you can paint, you can write, you can sing, you can play an instrument, you can move, you can dance, just you know, using any art modality of your choice, just take the next few moments to process whatever came up for you during that exercise. That was lovely. Uh, it was so wonderful to hear you guys play and create music together. Um, so yeah, I just want to open it up and just, you know, chat about how that experiential activity was for both of you. I'm glad that it's recorded because I'd like to go back and actually hear your guided meditation, I think. I, I like that you asked the question about the temperature because I was imagining the days. It's, it's either extreme always. It's like either too hot or too cold. Yeah. It's interesting for me too. I immediately imagine yeah. my bones are cold. It's a very familiar like, chill that goes down to your bones. My dissertation advisor, I have two, one of them, she said something that has been sitting, me, sitting with me since, which is sometimes we do have energies that are, need to actually be discharged. And that her friend uh, who was a new mother was talking about how the energy that is formed as the milk, it needs, so it's like a relief actually when the child takes. And just complicating that notion of not, not all taking is bad. And the reason why I'm saying this, it seems like this, but actually is that I think as performers and creators, we have built up that capacity for that energy to be given. And in this past year in the pandemic, we haven't had a place necessarily for that energy to go. So it feels like the milk is being stored in the body and we're finding new ways to give it out, but it has to go somewhere. It, we've spent years learning the discipline of developing it. Now our bodies are developing it and we're not sure. And I think that this exercise was just marvelous for me because it felt like it discharged. Mm. Like, you know, I was like, oh, I forgot that it's been building up. And finally it was like, oh, okay. And it needs to, that needs to go for the new to come up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just feel like I hope as many artists as possible hear this meditation. Because I think that's mm -hmm. what, like, I don't know if that's what you were, if you were going, if that's, if you were talking about that or feeling that, but mm -hmm. like the experience of putting my body back in that place to be able to feel like, oh God, it's cold. I know it's cold. It's really cold. I don't know why venues always do this. But the second you start playing, it's like your body just heats up. And like remembering that, it was just kind of like, oh, my body is going through the motions of something it needs to to feel healthy. So, yeah, I think kind of yeah, like you were saying, there's energies of all sorts are kind of stored in our bodies, right, in different ways and different places. And um, the arts can be one way to sort of release that, and meditation can be one way to release that or allow that to flow in some way. So. Um, that kind of brings us to the end of our episode, but I just, I really wanted to thank you both so much for 
it's, you know, all of your wisdom and just everything that you've shared about your creativity, your process, you know, the way that you engage with others in your work and just, it was wonderful to hear you both, you know, play and sing and just talk about your process. So please, please continue putting work out there because everyone loves it and everyone really appreciates it. So thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chai Side Chats with Ganavya and Rajana, as well as our guided meditation at the end. Please do like, share, and subscribe to the Creativity Awakening YouTube channel for regular updates on videos and episodes. Uh, episodes for Chai Side Chats premiere every two weeks, so stay tuned for our next one coming soon.